Let me call to order the February 5th, 2020 meeting, uh, Committee of the Whole meeting for Pottstown's Borough Council. Would you rise for a moment of silence, followed by the pledge to the flag. start with a resolution and uh, to honor uh, one of our favorite citizens here in the town. Chief. Okay. Recognizing Joseph M. Groff for 40 years of dedicated service to the borough of Pottstown and the Pottstown Fire Department. Whereas Joseph M. Groff has served the borough of Pottstown as a dedicated volunteer firefighter with the Philadelphia Steam Fire Engine Company number one for 40 years. And whereas during his career with the borough, he served in the capacity as fire chief for the Philadelphia Steam Fire Engine Company for 28 years, and whereas Joe has served the borough of Pottstown and its residents and has been called to duty at various hours of the day and night in all types of emergency response situations in order for the community to receive the best level of fire safety while saving lives and saving properties. And whereas Joe unselfishly continues to serve this borough and the Pottstown Fire Department as a volunteer with the Philadelphia Steam Fire Engine Company Number 1, sharing his expertise, qualifications, and professionalism. Now, therefore, be it, and it is hereby resolved by the Mayor and Town Council, that Joseph M. Groff is officially recognized for the outstanding service he has provided the Borough of Pottstown through 40 years of service to the Borough of Pottstown and its residents. Adopted at Pottstown Borough Hall, 100 East High Street, this fifth day of February, 2020. By the Burgess and the Town Council of the Borough of Pottstown, signed by Dan Wynn, President of Council, and attested by Borough Manager Justin Keller. I have to do a speech. Uh, most of you know I'm not really a speaker. So I just want to thank everybody, council, uh, managers, everybody responsible for this uh, award. Uh, the gentlemen standing up here with us, uh, the young guys that fought fire with, with a lot of them, but uh, they're going to be the future, and I feel very, very confident that they're going to support this uh, borough to the day they retire. So that's all I got. Subcommittee reports, infrastructure. Anyone here? No. Economic development and business liaison is Lee Clark. Welcome. Good evening, councilors, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to take a moment tonight to talk about Census Day, April 1st. I am a subcommittee chair uh, for the county for the census. 
And it is important for Pottstown because it is uh, representation. It means what representation politically will have in the future, what infrastructure improvements we'll get, what education funding we'll get. And uh, Pottstown traditionally has been undercounted. Last, 10 years ago, it was 70% of a response rate. I know there has been some fear about filling things out in the census. There shouldn't be that fear. The citizenship question has been struck down by the courts, so that is not on there. It's a very simple form. You can do it online, by telephone. If you don't do it uh, within a certain amount of time, they will have what they call the enumerators come out. They will have identification and they will come out and ask you the questions. It's important to count children. If a child has not been born by April 1st but is expected, that child is not counted. If the, if the child comes on April 2nd and you don't answer till April 3rd, you can count the child. So those are just some important highlights that we want to get out there. You will see more and more from the county, I know, the mayor spoke about it this morning. There are a lot of advocates out there, like myself, talking about how important the census is. We only get this every 10 years. The last is a dollar figure. 5%, just a 5% undercount throughout the county is a loss of $72 million plus. And that is every year for 10 years. So that's how important it is. Okay, that's my pitch for the census. Great. Uh, and it's important for economic development because obviously infrastructure projects are extremely important to the borough of Pottstown. I want to talk just a little bit about all the great things that are going on here are important, but we also want to highlight that we have a really great inventory of office space within <coughs> the borough. Paid is highlighting for 2020 four buildings. I have um, some brochures for council this evening. Um, I'd like you to share when you're out with your travels. And it's not about the space, it's the offices and the jobs or the occupants of those offices and the jobs that they will bring. And it is important, so we make sure we have lunchtime business for all that great downtown business that has located here as well as hopefully people who will want to move into the borough to be close to their jobs. So that is my report. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next transportation. Anyone? I, we did meet. Yeah. Do you want to take it? I can cover it, right. yeah, <laughs> right, that's fine. <laughs> Next month. <laughs> so we reviewed the plan uh, for the future grant-funded projects at the airport. We also talked about the closeout for the T-hanger uh, and taxiway paving project, which is now um, pretty much complete. We uh, updated the status of the um, police storage relocation and equipment relocations. We shared the part ridership information which included an update on the new routes and schedules. And uh, PART is currently planning to install an electronic fare box sometime in, in 2020 as well. So that's what we'll be working on uh, for the foreseeable uh, future. Great. Thank you. Okay, Ordinance Review Committee, Councilor Prosco. Uh, we finally uh, got together and finalized some of the items for uh, Council's review this evening. Okay, and uh, you'll be submitting that. I'm sorry? It's submitted. Yeah, I believe it's okay. you know, yeah. uh, one of our Good. agenda items. All right. Efficient methods. Um, Councilor Lebedinsky is not here. Uh, hopefully you can get back to us on Monday. Boards and committees. <coughs> Emergency services reports. Chief. Good evening, everyone. And thank you to all the firefighters that came out tonight to honor Joe. Uh, Last month, uh, we did have a, a dinner for Joe, and it was well received, and the Chiefs gave him a lot of gifts that probably couldn't be presented here, but, you know, they, yeah, <laughs> he, uh, he was uh, well recognized a month ago, so I want to thank those guys for that. Uh, as far as the fire service goes, we did have our fire committee meeting last week, mm -hmm. and we're taking a good hard look at ourselves. We're going to review our policies and procedures and see where we're at, and it's a, a pretty major undertaking just 
review in the mall and make it sure they meet today's needs. So that's where we're at with that. As far as the month went, we had 94 fire calls, and I can report we didn't have anything significant, but we probably lead the league in uh, heater fires. So I'm hoping that people listening will get their heater service and check. And as far as EMS, they had 314 calls in the fire this month. So it was a pretty busy month overall for both, both services. Yes. But that's it for tonight. Thank you. Human Relations, Ms. Levengood. Good evening, uh, Councilors, Council President, and Madam Mayor. Um, February is Black History Month, and it's an annual celebration of achievements and recognizing the role of African Americans in United States history. Um, just want everybody to be aware of that um, State Rep. Joe Cerisi and Senator Bob Mensch, um, they're going to be co-hosting an interfaith forum um, for the community from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. on Tuesday, February the 11th, and that's going to be held at the carousel. Mm -hmm. And um, the public, everyone's more than welcome to attend that. Um, and the commission's next meeting um, <coughs> will be held on February the 20th um, at 6 p.m. in council chambers, and again, all are welcome to attend. Thank you. Ms. Penrod, land back. Today, a couple of land bank members and interested parties attended the Pottstown Housing Coalition next door. There are a lot of people there. Um, uh, it, it seems to be a very valuable um, means of communicating between several different uh, groups in Pottstown, including the fact that they have a task force in the coalition on land bank. So it will be a great, a great way to keep in touch. Um, we're waiting uh, on a grant request we submitted last year for under a state program that would uh, provide funding for us to acquire what we believe will be our first three properties for processing. And then number three, we're planning on a public meeting at the end of March uh, to introduce the land bank, uh, introduce the web page, uh, procedures, and to solicit interest from uh, reputable developers, essentially a uh, call for qualified developers under the land bank program. So baby steps, but we are moving. And while you're there, tell us about the library. Well, again, um, several of you were present this morning for uh, uh, the Hobart's Run Community Leaders Breakfast that was hosted at the library. Thank you for coming. I hope that we were able to demonstrate that we're trying to be very good stewards of the funding that you do provide to us, uh, for which we thank you very much. Um, you heard from me this, uh, that our charity fundraiser, which right now is our largest separate independent fundraiser program, is fully subscribed for chairs and, uh, and uh, artists and sponsors. So thank you for those of you who are participating thus far in that. Um, we're um, going for the 100th anniversary celebration in 2021 as part of our capital fundraising campaign uh, to help with some extraordinarily unsexy financial needs we have, such as stormwater management, um, sunken parking lot, 100-year-old clay pipes, uh, sewer piping, modern toilets. So that's going to be a, an awful subject. Um, in, in 2019, the annual report, we note that we circulated well over 1,000 print and audiovisual, no, 100,000 print and audiovisual items and tens of thousands of electronic downloads. So around about 150 things were circulated, which is a lot of things. Um, we have received about 100 new card holders for Pottstown alone out of the 1,100 that we gained overall for the year. And in February, uh, 180 kids are signed up for a Saturday reading program, which is focusing on the 1920s. Incidentally, that's when Wonder Bread was introduced. So mm -hmm. some of them had their first slice of Wonder Bread, I don't doubt. And um, we're active with vote voter registration forms, census forms. We're going to try and do something surrounding the census. The library sits at the corner of four separate census tracts in the middle of not so great census participation. And so we're hoping that, if, we're hoping that maybe in May we can drag people into our computers to get them to sign up if they have not yet responded to the paper form 
or to door knockers. So we'll stay in touch with all the census people on that. Very good. Uh, record Center, Councillor Kirk. Um, Lydia from the uh, uh, Border Town. Uh, Special Services is here. Oh. Hi. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me tonight. Um, so we're really excited to give an update on the Ricketts Center. We opened on January 1st after doing some upgrades to the building, phase one. Um, so January 21st was our first day open. 21 people were in attendance. February 4th, we had 68. So a big increase in a short period of time. Um, right now we're open Monday through Friday, 11 to eight with Saturday hours coming in March. Um, so on February 4th, when we had 68 attendees, we offered after school academics program, academics program which is homework help and tutoring. Um, a meal, we, all, we had the dance team, soccer for success, and karate training. So there are volunteers that are leading the programs that are happening in the building, which is fantastic. Um, we will be expanding in the next couple weeks with a crochet group, art classes, yoga, and hopefully more than that also. We're looking at basketball and possibly a baseball program as well. Hmm. We do have an open house next Thursday, February 13th. It's from 2 to 6. The Potsdam Ministerium is hosting this. Um, and I also wanted to say thank you to the Potsdam Ministerium and the Hill School because they did the Martin Luther King celebration. And the collection that day was just over $3,100 and that was provided to help with the upgrades that we've been doing to the building. Um, so what we're calling phase one of the upgrades was focused on offering a safe and clean space for the people coming through the building. So it in, included cleaning, um, the exterminator, getting the alarm and fire system um, upgraded. We painted the whole downstairs and the gym. There was new vinyl trim installed in the rooms that needed it. New carpeting put in the computer room. Um, there was nothing in terms of tables, chairs, computers, so that was all installed. And we also had a dance floor put into the back room, which makes it a nice surface for the dance team, karate, different groups like that to be able to use. Um, and then in the next week or two, there'll be a new front door installed that has a magnetic locking system like schools have. Um, that again was focused on offering a safe and clean space. So there's a lot of other ideas that we want to do with the building and the space. Um, so looking forward to continuing to work through that. I also wanted to say thank you to Parks and Rec in the borough because um, Michael and the team, they were a huge help with the upgrades in the building, helping with the fire system, uh, lighting installs and ceiling tiles that needed replacing, which was a, a big task. So thank you very much your help with that. Um, so we are beginning to plan for the summer, which is a big task. So we'll, more information to come on that. Um, and we need volunteers. So we have volunteer packets. Um, they're on our website. We also have a Facebook page. And then they can be emailed or picked up in person at the center if anybody is interested in volunteering. Um, it can be anything from leading a class to just helping with the meal that's served or helping with the after school program. We're looking at other models for the after school program and how we can improve the one we're offering, where it's more of a one to one or one to two ratio of helpers, um, whether they're teens or adults helping the children with their homework and some academic studies and reading. Um, so that was everything I had for an update. Did anybody have any questions about the programs or what we're doing in the building? No. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pottstown School District, Councillor Lindsay. So, um, when the school district had their meeting, I was in Einstein Hospital. So I didn't go to the meeting. However, comma, mm -hmm. they um, live stream it, so I saw it the next day. So I saw it that Friday. And I missed a good meeting because they had um, the pot, uh, the high school um, teachers uh, had 100% growth, and the highest level in the state that measured for math, reading, and biology score. So they had, um, you know, they had announced different teachers. There was a lot, so I wasn't going 
you know, announce it. But you can see the live stream on Facebook. And I thought that was great that our teachers did 100%. So kudos to the Pottstown High School teachers. So I thought that was really great. Wow. Yes, 100% growth with the students. So Very good. Thank you. Uh, mayor's report. Do anything interesting this month? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Peggy did a lot of my work for me, so thank you. <coughs> I am also on the uh, 2020 Complete Count Census Committee for Montgomery County. And um, just to say that this is extremely important for everyone to respond. As Peggy said, I think Pottstown in 2010 was, um, had only reported 70% of the population had reported. If we could be, I would love to say that we were 100% for okay. 2020. If we can get to 90, I will be extremely, extremely happy. Of course, we are going to be doing competitions with Royersford and other Montgomery County um, municipalities so that we can show them that Pottstown is number one in reporting. Um, again, this is important because that funding determine it the count determines the amount of funding that we get for our schools for infrastructure for senior programs for snap for just so many things so may, there's going to be five mailings that go out um starting may sorry no march 12th through the 20th you will be able to start to respond by phone or online um april 1st is census day if anyone knows anyone at the airport that wants to make a big sign to pull behind their airplane or write in the sky, Pottstown's April 1st Census Day, I would greatly appreciate it. We could get some media there and um, get some publicity. So you're supposed to report as of April 1st. Who is in your household? If you do not respond by um, May, you will start getting knocks on your doors. So please look out for mailings starting in uh, mid-March. You can go online and start reporting. I have sample, sample uh, questionnaire here in Spanish and in English. The questionnaires are in, translated in 60 different languages. Here is a sample of some of the questions they are going to ask you. Number of people at your address, who's living there, what their relationship is to you, your phone number, your name, and your race, age, date of birth, and sex. And I'm pretty sure that's not a yes or no question. So um, if you have any questions, go to 2020census.gov and more to come on that via social media and hopefully we can get something on our webpage. So that's the census. Then I would like to say a huge, huge thank you to Sandy Hingston from uh, Philadelphia Magazine. She came out and spent a couple hours with me um, to interview me. Um, and we are now in the February edition of Philadelphia Magazine. It's about millennial mayors. Um, so I'm in there along with Royersford and Phoenixville and Bridgeport. Um, and it's titled Small Town Hero. We got a nice plug in Philadelphia Magazine and I took Sandy for the interview to JJ Radigan's. So they got a nice little plug in here. <laughs> and um, just for the record, I want to clarify that I really had nothing to do or and was not responsible for bringing in Santa um, via Dragon Boat to Pottstown. Um, I can't take credit for that. I was merely a cheerleader on the sidelines, but Alex Thigpen and Peggy Lee Clark from Paid um, deserve all the credit for that. Um, so if you'd like to read the article, I don't have the online version. I have a scanned version. I don't know what the uh, link is. I don't think we can get one, but I have an extra copies up here if you want to read about how cool Pottstown is. And we went to our community leaders breakfast meeting this morning. Trinita was there with me. 
and asked me since I was writing things down to kind of run through some of the things that are going on. So um, we've got the Susical musical, which is coming up um, on February 29th. If tickets are five dollars, I believe. If you would mm -hmm. like to be more generous and attend the luncheon um, at 12 before the musical at two, the tickets are fifty dollars. There is Youth Community Squash starting on Sundays at Hobart's Run. There's a block cleanup competition that uh, Hobart's Run and Reading, well, I guess Pottstown and Reading are going to be having. Um, uh, we are all supposed to dress as superheroes and clean up our town on March 28th, and we're going to be competing with Reading. And April 25th, Cemetery Cleanup. The Pottstown newsletter came out from Parks and Rec today, I believe, Michael. Correct. Yes. <coughs> the links were corrected today, so everything's good. Okay, okay. great. Um, we have sushi now Yay. at the terminal. Unfortunately, I have not yet gone, but I promise that I will go this weekend. As many of you saw on Facebook, um, February is, I'm deeming February to be fist bump February. There's a huge, lots of flus going around. My household got hit really hard. Um, thankfully, knock on wood, I haven't gotten it yet. But as you know, we all shake lots of hands and um, interact with each other. So if we could help to stop the spread of germs through Pottstown, I would greatly appreciate it. Wash your hands and um, let's protect a lot of our citizens that are on uh, undergoing chemotherapy treatments who have weakened immune systems. There's fundraisers at the carousel for Ryers Farm on the 14th of March. There's also an interfaith forum at the carousel on February 11th. Montgomery County Community College is having a blood drive on February 23rd. And from what I hear, we're gonna have a beer fest in March. Mm -hmm. Just 21st. 21st, mm -hmm. okay. And Oh, did I mention that I went to the Elks Charity Ball? Um, it was really, really well done. I'd like to thank Lynn Paulin. Um, she did a phenomenal job decorating. The theme was uh, kaleidoscope, hence my nails. And um, also, I'd like to thank the high school uh, culinary class uh, for making dinner for that event. It was phenomenal, and uh, those kids are pretty talented. One last thing, if you could continue to keep Bishop Everett Devnim in your thoughts and prayers for a swift recovery. And uh, if, you, if you see him on Facebook, you can let him know. We all miss him, and um, we wish him the best. I think that's it. Very good. How about from our manager? All right, very well. Well, first, I'm thrilled to announce that um, we have selected a new finance director. So um, we have selected Ann Maletsky. Um, she has her uh, master's um, in business administration and uh, finance. And as she'll be the borough's new finance director. So Ann will begin on February 12th and shadow Janice Lee until Janice's departure on March 18th. Most recently, Ann was a senior site controller at Limerick Nuclear where she, she is responsible for overseeing a multi-million dollar capital and operations budget. And is also involved in various uh, nonprofits locally and is a product of the Tri-County Leadership Academy. And later this month, she'll be awarded the Community Champion of Excellence Award as part of the Tri-County's Young Professionals Awards Gala. So everyone, please uh, take some time to welcome Ann aboard to the Borough team. Hey. <laughs> Another personnel note, we have a um, retirement. Police Captain Robert Thomas submitted his 90-day uh, notice that he will be retiring from the Pottstown Police Department and leaving on the DROP program on April 17, 2020. So uh, thank you, Captain Thomas, for, for your service here. We are planning to have a joint school board meeting. Uh, we've, it's been a while since we've gotten together with the school board, and we now have 
a lot of projects and topics that we're working on together and it's appropriate to get everyone updated and, and talking again. So we will be providing updates on our walk and bike educational program as well as uh, paid and their economic development efforts, the sustainability plan, blight remediation efforts, and the ULI study. So that'll take place at the school district administration building, 630 February 27th. In response to some of the citizen comments we received uh, last month's meetings, we sent out our LNI team to follow up on the dog complaints at 441 Johnson Street. Um, we uh, also uh, put in a request to the SPCA for a visit to the property, and that was that was granted. So SPCA went in, they did their inspection, and what they had found was that the condition of the animals and the, and, and the property um, seemed to be in pretty good condition and the dogs were, were well, cared, well cared for and there were no signs of, of neglect. Hmm. If you recall, the neighbors asked council to also look into placing a restriction on the number of um, pets or dogs allowed per property. And I believe several years ago, um, when council previously discussed implementing ordinance restrictions on household pets, it was met with some resistance from PETA and other animal rights activists in the area do the burden it further restrictions placed on the majority of good standing pet owners. So that said, Ellen and I will continue to coordinate with SPCA to regularly monitor um, the property for animal odor, animal waste, and other property code violations. Um, we, we, they did give us their express permission to enter their property to do inspections at any time, so we don't need permission to go onto their property. Um, and uh, at this point, we're we've been through uh, been before the judge six times on this property. Um, we sent our LNI staff down each each time, and the judge, you know, agrees that you know we should have permission to enter the property. And at this point. Um, typically, we have to follow a process in order to have violations addressed. So there's first a, a notice sent out, then then a waiting period, and then a violation. Uh, at this point, the judge is in agreement with us that there will be no more notice sent, sent out. It will just be citations at this point um, that will be sent to that property. So um, we'll continue to monitor it, um, but that is what we found with that property. Sure. Um, did the uh, owners know that that inspection was going to happen? Did they know ahead of time? I'm not sure, but they will not be aware if, when, if and when future inspections will be occurring. Okay. I can tell you that. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming the first one they were made aware of it. Um, I mean, they, they're reporting, my team is reporting that, you know, they are seeing progress with the property. She's, she's, picking up better after the dogs, um, keeping the house cleaner. And, um, you know, she understands that we're, we have to look out for the, the greater good of the community and protect the community with this with this effort. And um, it's been a process, but we're, we're trying to work with her, but we're not being lenient at the same time. The second citizen concern was a, a stormwater inlet and conveyance issues on Warren Street. And uh, this was responded to via email from me, uh, and a formal, formal letter was also prepared and sent by our public works director. Um, if you recall, this was in the area of Warren Street, also where Washington Street meets uh, Wilson Street. Uh, in summary, there are two issues reported, stormwater conveyance and stormwater infiltration into our sanitary sewer. The stormwater conveyance system was inspected visually by the camera. Uh, and also um, by looking at it uh, in locations during high and low flow rain events. And our team found that the inlets and the stormwater and pipes in that area were in great condition. There were no damage or blockages reported uh, on that system or downstream along Washington Street. And the stormwater system, what we have found is adequate for most, most storm events. Um, it would be very difficult and co costly to add capacity to handle greater flows from excessive rain and events that have been experienced more frequently in recent years. Um, if you recall, 
2018 and 2019 were some of the wettest years on records, mm -hmm. on record, and um, you know our systems weren't designed with that in mind. Um, it would be uh, of little benefit to increase the pipe size on Wilson Street to try to address the <coughs> increased amount of rainfall if the downstream pipes cannot handle the increased amount of flow. So what would need to be done is the system would have to be evaluated downstream to determine if an increased pipe size would be needed to allow for more capacity to, throw, to flow through that, that section. And that study may have to involve the entire collection system all the way to the Schuylkill River. So we're talking mm -hmm. about a very extensive study and potentially very costly and extensive construction to address this issue, which to our knowledge is just on Warren Street. And obviously the borough would not be in a position to provide the funds for construction. We would rely on grants for any type of construction of that scale. And one of the caveats there is that the grant funding we would seek for this project would, would directly compete with the grant funding we're seeking for the stormwater arch rehabilitations, because they're the same pots of money. And right now, um, you know, unless I'm directed differently, arch rehabilitation is currently a priority. Mm -hmm. For the sanitary sewer issue, the team did find a sagging sewer main pipe on Washington Street and a hydraulic bottleneck at the intersection of Washington and, and Wilson Street. Both these items were reconstructed <coughs> Excuse me. Reconstructed this fall under the authority's sanitary um, sewer collection system uh, improvement projects. So, the improvements that have been made to date to the sanitary sewer in that location will improve the amount of water that can move through the pipes. However, just with the stormwater system, once the pipes are filled to capacity from stormwater infiltration, it takes more time for the water levels to recede. Back, back to normal. So I think that in conclusion for both of those issues is that, you know, our pipes are handled, are, are designed to handle a certain amount of, of volume. Um, and once rainfall exceeds those volumes, um, their issues can be created, usually over a short period of time, you know, clearing uh, 15 or 20 minutes after the rain event has, has passed. And then lastly, I just wanted to make council aware that we've been receiving development interest for borough property located at 191 and 193 South Hanover Street. This is also known as the Hess Lot, located at the corner of College Drive and, and Hanover Street. <clears throat> In reviewing the requirements under the borough code for disposition of uh, public property, the borough would have two options to convey this property. The first option would be to list it for public auction under the borough code and the borough um, would uh, have the op option to sell that uh, at auction to the highest bidder. The drawback to that option is that there, other than what would be required through the zoning and land development approval process, this option would allow council little control as to the eventual use of the, of the property to make sure that it's the highest and, 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 and best use, and also use that, quite frankly, it's going to have the greatest impact to our tax revenues. Um, so the second option would be to convey the property to an economic development entity. And um, they, they would be able to convey the property that in their determination would be the highest and best use, but not necessarily the highest bidder. If you recall, paid Potsdam Area Industrial Development was originally conceived um, for exactly this purpose. And in the 1980s, it acquired and sold parcels in the Circle of Progress area. This second option also frequently, is also frequently used by the Montgomery County Redevelopment Authority for publicly owned properties uh, by municipalities uh, throughout the county. So it's not something that's, that's a new idea by any means. Given that this property is located in a key gateway location, we're currently considering the pros and cons of the two conveyance methods. And after meeting individually with council members to determine their preferences, we will aim to have a, a recommended conveyance method for council's consideration in the upcoming months. Very good. And that's it. Edit. Thank you. <clears throat>
Now we have a presentation from Paula Bickelman. Where? Huh? 
because it's just this blog gray building and we plan to revitalize the exterior so that it becomes a, a focal point in the neighborhood. Uh, this is what it looks like as of last night. I took this picture just last night. Um, the ivy is taking over. The roof has a hole causing all that water damage on the outside and the inside. <coughs> uh, you can see it is <laughs> uh, very abandoned much vehicles included. Yeah, uh, yeah, abandoned vehicle included. Yes, um, but there is a sticker on that one will be going soon. Uh, but this has become kind of a uh, one one abandoned vehicle has been removed already. But this this property has become a magnet for not great things. We want to keep that out of the neighborhood for the families. Um, so 319.5 is traditional town neighborhood. Um, it is 2,400 square feet on each level, and the requirement is 2,500 square feet. So we're only short by 100 square feet uh, in order to meet the requirement. Um, and at 2,400 square feet per level, there's ample space for a two-bedroom apartment on this level. Um, and the, the, the biggest question I know all of you want is, can you get that done? <laughs> can you get it done timely? Can it be quality and can it be done respectfully? And to us, that is respect not just for the people in the neighborhood, but also respecting the history of Pottstown. Uh, this is an example of a property that we did uh, 10 months ago, 900 North Franklin Street. You can see the Jumanji of the house. Um, there were animals, uh, the I again, ivy. <laughs> the buildings love ivy. Um, almost every window was broken. Young people have been going in and making little movies, we found out from neighbors. <laughs> they were making their little horror movies. Uh, water infiltration throughout the first floor. There was a waiting pool on the third floor catching water because the hole was uh, bigger than a basketball in the roof. And it was about a four foot round hole through the yeah. slate. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this is what we mean about respecting history. Jesse R. Evans, former mayor of Pottstown, and his wife Mary Bleen. Do we recognize Evans and Bleen? Uh, they owned this house. They built this house. And you can see this is North End before there was a house. That there, was, there was 900 North Franklin. Um, and it was an amazing, uh, they, they called it the bones of the house, uh, but it definitely needed a lot of love. Um, we had lifts there. We actually kept the original slate roof. Every person we knew who rehabs talked about tearing it down. We said, no, 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 no. You don't need to tear down the slate roof. Um, and we were able to save it. Uh, with simple repairs, actually. But you can see the ivy was actually getting into the home. Uh, the, the roots of the ivy were probably five inch diameter at their largest. Um, and this is what it looked like afterwards. Uh, everything rebuilt on the outside, the inside is needed. And the kitchen went from that to a new modern kitchen. The dining room, all the hardwood floors were redone. They were not torn out, they were redone. This big plank, random plank size. Yeah. There's the waiting pool. We weren't kidding when we said a waiting pool. But the, <laughs> the upstairs um, actually became a master suite. Um, and we would bring this quality to 67 Walnut Street. The downstairs needed uh, about $7,000 in mold remediation because of all the water infiltration. We do everything right to make sure that people have healthy living inside. Um, and it only took 16 weeks to do all of that. It only took 16 weeks uh, from the day we bought it. Uh, the day we bought it, we had uh, I mean, tree crews out there tree clear, crews. clearing the acre lot, pulling the ivy off the house. Yeah, that's why there was a lift. They were pulling it out by hand because they wanted to save the roof. Um, but as I said before, we have a quality team. We are respectful of the history. And in that particular project, we partnered with the Pottstown High School te uh, text program they assisted us in demo, they got real world experience, and we donated a lot of the materials to the school as well. Uh, 67 Walnut Street is only 190 yards from our latest project that is on market right now at 143 Walnut Street. It used to be the house on the block. The couple went down on hard times. They decided to rent the house because the market, when the market collapsed, they couldn't afford to sell their home. And then they became absentee landlords. And as a result, um, there were many police calls, there were drugs, squatters, neighbors were bullied and frustrated. Uh, there was a uh, hundred yards of cleanup. There were three dumpsters that we cleaned out. The smell was unreal because they had a dog that was never allowed out. Um, and as a result, uh, all that mess was inside. Um, the night we started, the day we bought it, we cleaned out uh, two full dumpsters that night. We had a crew there at 5 o'clock at night and they cleaned out all night. 
and we had people driving down the street yelling, thank you, Jesus, out of their, <laughs> out of their windows because they were just they so happy. They the trouble house of the neighborhood. Yes. Yes. This is an amazing block. It's an amazing section of Pottstown, and this one house destroyed it. And again, that's why we do what we do because one house can take something away and one house can bring it back. So now this is what the house looks like today. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we used a local artist to do custom glass in the front door. We use local uh, whenever we can. Uh, we do, because we, uh, we even buy Saratoga appliances. <laughs> we get, uh, because they're, they're just such great people. But we, we were able to do all this in uh, under three months as well. <coughs> um, and so 67 Walnut Street, in honor of the history of Pottstown, and William Van Buskirk Carriage Factory, which in 1885 <coughs> occupied the same piece of land. This is from the uh, Sanborn Fire Mass, <coughs> 1885. William Van Buskirk Carriage Factory. Goose Run is the name of the waterway that goes actually underneath the building. Um, so rather than people <coughs> saying that they live at 67 Walnut Street, we hope that they will be proud to say they live at Carriage House at Goose Run. So we are asking uh, tonight we're seeking a letter of support from Borough Council and we're requesting to not return for a conditional use hearing as we are meeting every criteria uh, under conditional use other than the 100 additional feet. I just remember blighting 900 North Franklin Street. What a, oh, really? a, <laughs> a, a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Can, can I make a comment? Sure. I can vouch for their work. They did a house right across the street from mine, or uh, former Mayor Ann Chumluck's old house, and it is beautiful. They did one hell of a job. Oh, yeah, yeah someone from Philadelphia well, Magazine came through Pottstown over the weekend. We're going to be at Philadelphia Magazine again in April, by the way. Mm. Yes, yeah, uh, they went through Pottstown with a real estate agent and another uh, person who uh, rehabs uh, in, in Pottstown. Um, and they took them to J.J. Brigham's and Very Best and a bunch of other places around town to show how great we are. Oh, I think that's because when Sandy came out to interview me, um, Keith Costello, who was one of the owners yeah, of J.J. Radigan's, yeah, was, was telling her how somebody from Philadelphia Magazine had not come out or was not interested in Pottstown. So thanks to Sandy and Keith, got them out and yes. now will be featured mm -hmm. again. Thanks. I am familiar with your work at 900. <clears throat> North Franklin. I I was in the house before, oh, for you. <laughs> and I was there when you had open house after you had finished. You did a remarkable transformation. Thank you. Really did. Uh, my my question on the property at 67 Walnut. Um, you have 2,400 square feet per per level, per level. Yes. and you're making four units. So each will be about 1,200. Um, minus, minus common space. Mm -hmm. and the utility room, there'll be at least a thousand square feet of these. For a two bedroom unit. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's all. Anyone else? Just a question on, on the previous two properties that, that you had renovated. Um, how do you how do you dispose of them or what's your preference for disposing of them to a, to a new owner? Um, do you mean sale? Sorry, yeah, sure. do you sell them? Do you rent them out? Uh, yes, what do you do uh, with them? We, yes, we um, up to this point have not uh, had rental um, because we believe absolutely in home ownership. Um, but with this building, it's not made to be a single family home. Um, and leveling it would be uh, kind of crazy <laughs> because, because it, it could absolutely be a phenomenal uh, home for people. Um, this corner uh, at York and Walnut was industrial in all four corners. At the time, I mean, you can see William Van Buskirk was there, the lumber yard was there, there was a uh, millinery um, across the street. It's just um, now it's, it, it's all residential and we want it to be that way. We have a, a friend of ours uh, who owns 75 units, quality units in Pottstown and they are mentoring us through the uh, landlord process to make sure that we are uh, being respectful of every tenant that would be in our building. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll do that. Okay, so we'll list that for action on Monday.
Okay, cable franchise agreement. That could be you. Yeah, so this still stands uh, as we have it, uh, as we had presented it previously to you. Um, Ten-year contract, uh, five percent of the fee, uh, and uh, we would like to wait until March when a representative from Comcast would be here to present uh, to you and ans answer any questions that you may have about Comcast or the agreement. Okay. Horb, uh, Planning Commission, date. Yeah, so if you recall, we brought this idea to you last month of um, looking into ways in which the Planning Commission and, and the HARB Board can work together more efficiently. I believe that most of you had received a um, memo from Solicitor Garner's office kind of outlining the pros and cons of each, um, of each uh, way to look at it. And at, at this point, it still seems like holding the hard meetings on the same night as the Planning Commission meetings would be the, the best uh, opportunity. And so we, were, we will reach out, if we haven't already, to the HARB members to see if they would be open to moving that meeting night to the Planning Commission night. Mm -hmm. And um, we can let you know on, on, on Monday whether or not they're, they're open to that. Okay. Very good. So are there any questions? No. no. All right, 11 is miscellaneous zoning, uh, master traffic and regulation ordinance amendments. Yeah, so uh, we have a, a couple here that we'd like to bring to you. Um, some are zoning uh, changes and others are, are ordinance changes. Uh, the, the ordinance changes, we'd like to ask for authorization to advertise. The zoning changes, we'd like to ask for authorization um, to hold a, a hearing to review those changes. That would be the first step for both of those process processes. Mm -hmm. So the first one is to eliminate the um, zoning requirements for downtown off-street parking. And the reason for this is that the committee believes that the downtown is essentially built out and new uses are struggling to identify sufficient off-street parking facilities to meet the ordinance minimum standards. And what this is going to result in as the downtown gets redeveloped is an influx of uh, zoning variance applications. And the committee feels that since council recently redesignated the downtown district for the purpose of zoning um, and limited to the greatest extent possible future um, development to uses that are consistent of the vision of the downtown the committee believes that the parking restrictions will only serve to hinder favorable development. So the recommendation is to eliminate parking requirements in the downtown for um, existing buildings. All buildings? Any and all? Yeah, any and all. Yeah. Okay. And is there any limitation to the number of units or rentals inside? At this point, it's it's been something that's been discussed and um, you know one of the things there still is a requirement for commercial on on the first floor correct so that limits the amount of, of units that, that, that they could have in that regard um, but the general feeling of the committee and we, we did discuss this in, in depth was that generally most of the existing buildings that we have today really couldn't be cut into too many apartments because they're, they're very small buildings as they, as they are. So one of the things that they considered was that um, maybe the parking requirements should apply only for new buildings or a, 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 an existing building that has expanded more than um, a certain amount of square feet. I, I know the number 500 square feet was, was mm -hmm. thrown out there. Um, but that's their, 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 their recommendation at this, at this point. Okay. Is there any other questions on the, on the parking? Okay. All right, so the second one, this is, a, this is a, a, an, an ordinance, a code enforcement section, is to exempt owner-occupied residential properties from the master plumbing requirements. So currently to do uh, plumbing work, 
in the borough, you have to have a master plumber certification. Um, and the committee believes that this is unduly onerous on homeowners who may be able to perform their own plumbing work at a significantly lower cost and are best positioned to accept the risk of their work. So therefore, the committee rec realizes that not all properties are created equal. And they recommend that if a single family dwelling or, 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 a, du or a duplex or owner um, occupied, then the owner would be exempt from this requirement. You'll note, however, they are recommending that investment properties and income producing rental uses or apartments would still be required to use a master plumber. Right. So it's one of the efforts we're trying to, to, to take, one of the steps we're taking of many to make the borough more business friendly. Okay, next. The next one would be the revisions to <coughs> trigger for grading and stormwater permit requirements. Um, presently, right now, any earth disturbance impacting an area in excess of 125 s square feet requires a, a grading permit. We feel that's, that, that's too low. Um, in order to obtain that permit, the applicant is required to submit engineered plans, which meet the standards contained in section 105, so essentially, you know, an engineer, an engineer drawing to some extent. And the committee believe that the cost associated with this, minor, this type of minor land disturbance relative to the risk associated with such work do not warrant um, the continuance of this practice. So as a result, the committee is recommending that grading permits only be required for land disturbances impacting areas in excess of 500 square feet, um, which I believe would get you you know, a patio or two parking spaces for uh, in a driveway. Further, the committee recommends that the triggering point for stormwater management plans be, be reduced. Presently, stormwater is not regulated locally unless the earth disturbance is at least one acre. The committee proposes lowering this trigger to 1,500 square feet um, to better coincide with um, DEP uh, reviews and borough reviews that um, coincide with the DEP regulations. Um, also important that we look at this as evidenced by my items earlier in my manager manager's report. We're in we're experiencing increasing rainstorms, um, intensity and velocity. So um, I think that it does make sense to look at this. You know, no regulations for up to an acre. That definitely needs to be reduced. Um, so that we can start to make sure that we're not getting undue stormwater runoff. Are there any questions about that one? Any more? Oh, I got more. <laughs> so we also have revisions to the swimming pool uh, regulations, and this would be a zoning ordinance uh, re uh, requirement. So what we've been seeing is that, is that small inflatable pools have been incre become increasingly affordable and popular within the borough. and. Um, and allow to, to allow for better use of these types of pools, which presently may conflict with setback requirements, uh, we're recommending a couple changes. Uh, one would be to replace the definition for swimming pool with defini definitions for store storable swimming pool, above ground swimming pool, and in ground swimming pool, and allow permitted storable swimming pools to be located within four feet of the property line uh, each season. They would have to be removed at the end of, of, of each season. So that storable above ground was the other one? In ground. In, in ground, ground, yeah, which basically they probably need a light so our permit. swimming pool mm -hmm. regulation awesome. right now just says pool. Our definition yeah. covers all that. It just says pool. So what we're saying <laughs> is we want to break them out into yes. specifically what they are and create regulations that make sense based on what <clears throat> those specific pools are. Now should the pools be covered? No. Somebody go in there. Above ground Kids. swimming pools are typically designed so that they're above the height requirement for children. Mm -hmm. um, we already have requirements for below ground pools that, that do have to be fenced. Okay. Yeah. Hot tubs is in there too. Those blow up hot tubs. I had one once upon a time. Just saying. We'd have to check to see whether a storable hot tub or Permanent I hot tub would one. fall under but this. But it came with a cover. Uh huh. Yeah. I think Keith addressed that. I can't remember what his response was. But, uh, 
Yeah, I think that's already regulated under state law. We had the same discussion. These are the same set of ordinances that we looked at last summer, and we kind of held off on them so we would wait until we had the zoning a little more in line. So, so for those that were on council before, this is kind of repetitive, but for the new members, you can lean in where we're going with the ordinance changes. So if there are any other questions about that one, I have two more. Floodplain uh, cleanup is, is our next item that we'd like to uh, look at. So if, we, if you recall a while back, um, FEMA came in and drew new uh, flood, flood maps for the borough, and we also uh, adopted FEMA's floodplain ordinance. We've discovered that we actually, when we adopted that ordinance, there were some remnants of our old floodplain ordinance that we've never removed. And those, those items are now either um, duplicative or um, conflicting with the FEMA requirements that we adopted. Right. So um, we would just ask that we get rid of all the redundant requirements and go with the FEMA uh, requirements that we have in, in place there. Mm -hmm. And then uh, lastly, we now have uh, the kiosks, parking kiosks installed on, on High Street. Um, and if you recall, we've adopted the uh, parking, the on-street parking regulations for High Street already. Um, but through the rollout and through conversations with business owners and people that were using the, the, the app or the other systems, we found that the three-hour time limit was really prohibitive to people that wanted to spend their whole evening downtown, whether it's going to Steel River for a show and then having dinner and drinks afterwards. Mm -hmm. We felt like it was a little bit much to be asking them to move their cars every every three hours in those situations. So we're recommending that the three hour limitation be lifted um, and that's what this, this ordinance would, would do. Uh, additionally, I mentioned that we have uh, kiosks which are available for um, payments on street and in the lots. So we need to look at uh, our ordinance to make sure that we speak to the kiosks in our ordinance to show that they are a viable option to pay for uh, parking as well as identify their, their, their locations. And the big change with the kiosks is that like Park Mobile, they're going to go by pay by plate so you won't need the ticket or the, the receipt anymore to put on your windshield. Um, it'll be paid by plate and it'll also be enforced by plate so the officers will be able to pull up the kiosk app and know which vehicles hadn't paid. So you can use that to pay at a kiosk and park on street or at any of the lots. Um, and that's any kiosk, it doesn't matter. We also need to look at um, outside of the paid parking area with the closed loop project and road diet project on Hanover Street. Some of the parking areas were shifted on the east side to accommodate the line striping and there were actually parking spaces created on the west side. So we now need to um, incorporate those in into our ordinance. They would be a, uh, a three hour zone, um, but there would be no paid parking in that, in that area. And then lastly, uh, we've looked at the, the permit ordinances, and we feel that um, generally they, they, all look, they all look pretty good. We have uh, residential and business permit types. We, for the most part, we did not change the boundaries of the residential or the business permit types with the exception of the removal of a few side streets where we were not getting many applications. So I think York Street was, was one of them and uh, portions of Charlotte was another one where we would actually remove the permit requirement on those, on those streets at this time. Um, we also changed the permit types slightly so that residential permits are strictly for residents and business permits now include business, employees, nonprofits, and religious institutions. Um, so previously, the residential permit rates are typically uh, more of a reduced rate from the business permit rates. And so previously, we were subsidizing the permit rates for 
the nonprofits and um, the religious institutions, we would recommend category, categorizing them into the business category. Uh, also, we need to remove the references to Pedita because that's no longer a district anymore, and we now have a color-coded zone. Um, the big change to the parking permits is that we ha now have, we're proposing a new reduced rate parking permit that would allow you to park in any one of our numbered lots. So for uh, $125 a year, you can park in any one of our numbered parking lots. It's a first come, first serve. Um, if there isn't a space available in the lot you're looking for, you would be able to park in the next lot over. Um, this is open to, to any business, any resident, any visitor, regarding, uh, regardless of your mailing address. So this is different than the business permits and the residential permits because those are based on your physical address of your business or of your residence. If you're located outside that area, you cannot get a, a, a permit for those. Um, so there would, no, there would be, as a result of this, there would be no more reserved spaces in our parking lots anymore. Um, they would be open for permit holders or people that want to park by the hour. Um, what we found was that in some of the lots, with the, 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 the old method that we were, we were doing the permitting, in those lots we had spaces that were reserved and numbered, and you parked in that numbered space that was reserved for you. Mm -hmm. Well, when those people weren't there, we were losing revenue because those lots were filling up but nobody could park oh. in the reserve spaces. So um, we think it's better to go with this reduced, mm -hmm. reduced rate permit, let anyone park in any of our lots. And um, are there any questions about the parking? So if you reduce the, if you want the, time, the hours to be weighed for the three hours, what will it be? Instead of three hours, what is it, five? There's no time limit. Oh, so it no will just be that paid parking is in effect from 6 a.m. to 2 a.m., but there's no time limit. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The $125 fee that you were talking about, yes. is that a one-time or is it payable over 12 months? That's, pay, that's payable monthly, quarterly, <coughs> or yearly, depending on how long you're you going to be time. visiting <coughs> or, or you know, working here in, in the case right. of some of the businesses. And the idea for the reduced rate is that we want to try to get the longer term parkers into our lots so that we can free up more turnover on street mm. in front of the businesses. Mm -hmm. So that was the committee's thinking behind that. Maybe. Oh, I just had a question on the kiosk. Are we replacing or fixing? Because I thought the whole point of Park Mobile was in response to our antiquated uh, kiosks, parking yeah. kiosks. We've replaced them. We've replaced them. We've yeah. replaced them all. Um, it's a new one right so there. So we've replaced the two that we had in the in the Reading lot, lot number one, and the, the Charlotte Street lot, lot number two, and then we've added four other new locations along High Street. Okay. One mm -hmm. at York Street, one at Penn Street, um, one at um, Evan Street, and then one at the library. And all this information can be found on our parking web page. Okay. okay, if there are no more questions, we'll list this for Monday to uh, approve our solicitor to advertise. Very good. Destruction resolution. All right, so this is the, the resolution that we do every year for destruction of municipal records by the borough. Uh, finance, administration, licensing and inspections, park and recreation, utilities and police departments pursuant to the municipal records manual um, of December 16, 2008 and, and amended March 28, 2019. So um, you'll see in your packets <coughs> there's an appendix listing all the items that we would propose to uh, destroy. Not yet. Monday, we'll have the appendix. So right. by Friday evening, you can look and, and see the items that are listed to be destroyed. Um, what is our retention? Like, is it, it everything? Oh, okay. It depends what the record is. Um, 
state yeah, and, and yeah, the state has a manual, and we essentially follow that manual to a T when we when we go through our yeah, records. I was just curious because that's my field. <clears throat> the, the manual would identify all kinds of records and tell you the minimum time you have to keep them before you're allowed to destroy them. Okay. So uh, obviously, over time, we accumulate quite a few records, okay. and you need to act on a resolution before the, the records can be legally destroyed. Do we store our records on site or off site? Both. Okay. All right, we'll list that for action on Monday. 13 is a fee schedule amendment. Yes, yeah, so uh, recently the Office of Open Records or um, the, the people that uh, bless us with the right to know law have um, set forth a uh, recommended charge for different documents that we're, uh, that we, the borough, has to produce as a part of an, a right to know request. So. For a single-sided black and white, we would recommend adopting a, a fee of 25 cents a page. And we, for a, a single-sided color, we recommend adopting 50 cents uh, a page. Um, and then a C CD, DVD, $3, and then $5 for a, for a certified copy. Am I missing okay. anything? No, I think you hit them all, and then others are actual costs to uh, reproduce. So uh, they've modified what we can charge, and we're recommending that we go with their recommended charges. Very good. We'll list that for Monday. The auditing services proposal for 2020, 2021, and 2022. So Mally has been our auditor um, for a number of years now, and we're recommending that uh, we engage with them for a new three-year contract to cover us for the next three years. Okay. If there are no questions, we'll list that for action. Uh, 15, Monco 2040 resolution. Yes, so this is a um, collaboration project that um, uh, we would like to recommend for the Colebrookdale Railroad. Mm -hmm. So uh, we took a look at our needs for the Mon Montgomery County 2040 grant programs this year. Um, we don't have an immediate need for them this year. The good news is, is that Nathaniel, who's, who's here tonight with Colebrookdale Railroad, has actually um, come up with a plan that would not only help the railroad, but also help the borough um, in Memorial Park, where they're building the station. So they would plan to use these, these funds uh, to construct pedestrian improvements to Memorial Park, and also, um, if permitted by PennDOT, a pedestrian crossing over to um, the Potts Grove Manor to allow for better connectivity uh, throughout those those facilities. Um, Colbrookdale is <coughs> seeking two hundred thousand dollars. They will be responsible to um, write the grant and submit it to us. We will just uh, press the button and send it. And um, Colbrookdale will also be responsible for the twenty percent match requirement. So Nathaniel. Guest from Colbrookdale is here tonight. If there's anything I missed or you want to add, feel free to chime in. <laughs> Thank you. No. Okay. Any questions? All right. Gee, thanks for helping us. <laughs> okay, yes. we'll list that for uh, Monday evening. Board vacancies. Um, let me see. Uh, we have one application for Tom Hilton. And Tom, is that for both Planning Commission and HARB? And that's Council's desire, yes. Okay. Uh, we have one vacancy for HARB uh, for a term to expire April 1st, 2024. We have a, a vacancy for an alternate member on KEEP, that's our economic uh, development on Keystone Drive. And we have one four year term on the Planning Commission. So we will list that, and if there are people that volunteer or come forward, we'll handle that Monday evening. Okay. 17, yeah, the Hill you, School I just want to say, if you, re sure. if you recall, this gets back to the, er the earlier item where we were talking mm -hmm. about combining the meeting times mm -hmm. for the Planning Commission at HARB, and I believe that Mr. Hilton in his letter would be willing to serve in both if there, there can be some sort of streamlining, streamlining between those two mm -hmm. organizations. Okay. 
All right, 17 is the Hill School commencement. They, uh, what do they want to close? Beach? Yes, so Hill School would like to close Beach Street on May 23rd from 8 to 1 o'clock for their commencement exercises. Okay, and I think we do this most every year. That's correct. We'll list that for Monday. 18, Red Horse Motoring Club slash Veteran Island Project. Yes, uh, so they would like to hold an event at their facility and uh, they're requesting permission to close 3rd Street between York Street and Hanover Street. This is for a, um, a fundraiser and car and bike show. The date would be April 18th, 2020 from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Very good. And we've read through that. We'll list that for Monday. 19, uh, once again, Red Horse Motoring Club for the 2020 car shows. Yep, so Red Horse is back for car shows first Saturday of the month starting in April, running through September. The car shows would be from 4 to 9 p.m. Um, <coughs> they were proposed to close High Street between York Street and Evans Street. Um, closure of Cross of Hanover, Charlotte between King and South Street as well. Okay. Similar to last year. So are they, is that, is, is that a closing of Hanover Street and Charlotte Street? Yeah, so that would be different than last year. Oh. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I got okay. They did that last time. Stopped at Hanover. Yeah, it stopped at Hanover. Mm -hmm. They left Hanover open. Right. Mm -hmm. And right. then they left Charlotte open. And this year they want to close it. closed it. Correct. Oh, I don't know. Hmm. We'll, we'll save that for discussion. Well, I guess not. Previously, Canada was closed. I think it did just go to York, correct? I mean, Correct. I mean, several years ago. It did previously. So nothing new necessarily. Yeah. Different than last year. Yeah. Right. Last year, they held their last one in October? Correct. Yes. And they're only asking for permission through September? Yeah, I think what happened last year is they had a, a very bad weather event in mm -hmm. September, and that's why they wanted it. So nice okay. No other questions. We'll list that for action on Monday. Okay. Ah, Red Horse Car Show Beer Garden Request. So they'd like to hold a beer garden, I believe, in Smith Family Plaza. Oh. Yeah, Smith Family Plaza, and um, it would be for the dates of the car show. Of the car shows. Okay. Okay, if there's no question, we'll list that for Monday. Uh, and now uh, we'd like to have a discussion. Uh, we'll have it led by our solicitor, Mr. Garner, yeah. on council meeting rules of order and the Sunshine Act. Mr. Garner. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Um, in speaking with Justin and, and Dan, we thought it might be a good idea just to, to pick a couple of topics every month during the Committee of the Whole just to have a little round table with council to kind of explain what we do during the course of the year. And sometimes it's easier to talk about things in the abstract or theoretical rather than having an issue in front of us that you have to vote on. Mm -hmm. So um, the first couple of topics we, we kicked around were more procedural than, than substantive. And we thought that perhaps it'd be good just to uh, familiarize council to, to particularly the new members with some of the things that that we do all the time but try and put a, a reason behind them and explain exactly what they're there for so the, one of the first things that you guys did when you reorganized back in January is you passed a set of meeting rules and the meeting rules historically have kind of been passed down from council to council but meeting rules are really your rules and you need them, in my opinion, and you can set the rules however you want to set them, but you want to have an organized meeting and you want to have an efficient meeting. So the rules that you adopted at the reorg meeting, and I think you've looked at them and you have them in front of you, but they set up the framework of how we run the meetings or how you have chosen to run the meetings. And sometimes we have public comment and we have discussions about different things, and part of the rules that you've adopted uh, on their face 
encourage public comment, but at the same time forbid technically a dialogue between the council and the person that's raising the comment. The, the reason for public comment is to bring issues to you, not necessarily to debate that, but certainly you're permitted to debate or have a dialogue with anyone you want. So for the past, I'd say 10 or 12 years, the rules adopted by council allow the resident or the person to give a three minute uh, discussion and council is supposed to listen and not necessarily engage in a debate. But I know from the past, there's times council wanted to, wanted to talk, but technically the rules stop you from doing that. Well, if you read the rules and look through them, there is a process where you can make a motion to suspend the rules. And if you get um, a vote of five counselors, the rules can be suspended and you're allowed then to entertain a dialogue with the resident if you choose to do that. And we wanted to just bring all of the rules to your attention. There's only two pages of rules, but it kind of sets up exactly how you operate. And there's not necessarily right or wrong rules, but they're your rules. So just because other councils have done it this way doesn't mean you have to do it this way, but these are the rules that are in place for right now. So during the course of the year, if you find that any portion of our meeting is unwieldy or isn't working the way you want, you all can look at the rules and there's a process to amend the rules and you can vote to amend it. It's your meeting, it's your rules, it's your process. So if you ever have any questions about the rules and if, if you read them, it actually some of them seem to be a little more formalistic than we actually run the meeting. It talks about you're, oh, you're only supposed to talk for five minutes on a certain topic and everybody gets a chance to talk before someone else has a chance to talk again. Usually that doesn't happen but the rules are there in, in the event there would be a highly controversial topic and then you would have a procedure on how council could talk and who could talk and, and, and the time limit they could talk. So we just wanted to bring this to your attention because it is a fluid document, but it is a document that you guys have approved. So if there's ever any questions about the rules or thoughts to change, you can do that. You guys run the show, so um, just wanted to bring that up. A any questions about the rules as they're written now? Anybody have any thoughts or concerns about the, the meeting process? I just want to say thank you for bringing that to the audience's attention as well because I've seen, you know, citizens come up and make a comment to council and get very upset because we're not, you know, they're not responding. So um, it's important to know that we have these rules and that's why you're not getting a response, not because we're ignoring it. And, and Mayor, you're right. Typically, I think folks expect a, a dialogue and they don't get it. But the way the, the process is set up is uh, we have counselors' general discussion at the end of the meeting. So if any counselor wishes to, at that point, address the person mm -hmm. uh, based on what was said, that's the time to do it. Again, it's not necessarily a dialogue or a debate, but it's rather the uh, the resident has a concern, it brings the concern to your attention and has the ability to do that. And then if you have, if you do have a comment, you have the right to provide some kind of informal impromptu response at the time. And obviously the borough manager is going to look into it and get back with a more formal answer. But again, there was, there was some thought given to the rules as far as why they are what they are. But if you guys don't think they're proper, you can change them. But those are the rules that you operate under today. Yeah, and I'll just say that although we don't always respond to, to some of the comments, staff typically does look into each and every one of them and where applicable we get back to that resident to let them know, you know, what has been determined and the reason behind that. Um, and we're going to try to do a better job to follow up um, at the next meeting uh, during my report where I can kind of update or summarize for council what we found a lot of times you know we get hit with questions that um, we weren't really aware we're kind of getting hit cold and we have to go back and do more research and verify things before we can really give a, a cor correct and, and thorough answer to someone so that's just kind of some of the process that we follow internally right I did I did like what you did today whenever you did comment on the previous mm -hmm. comment yeah like uh, that I think that's that's something that. should be implemented constantly yes you know, that's, 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 I really I really like you know, like that. I agree with you, Joe. I was going to say the same thing. I like how you recapped okay. from last meeting. I like that. That was nice. 
my my thing is is that while we in the meeting and I'm like, oh, can I say something? I'm like, Jeannie, can I say something? And she say, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Because <laughs> I know she, she's like, mm -hmm. like, and as she's doing shorthand at the same time, I'm like, can I say something? She's like, no. Well, that was when I was new. So now I get the, um, I'm learning as I go that I certain, you know, that was in the beginning. I was like, and she was like, mm -mm -mm -mm. <laughs> no, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, ah, and then she, she stops me. But that's when, because, I mean, like, reading, like, at the moment, I'm not, I don't have time to be like, oh, let me read, can I see? Can I make sure I can say that? You know, so that was my my thing, you know. So it's it's like um, on-the-job training. Sure, lucky for you, you sit next to Jenny. That's what I told <laughs> I Thank you. Chris, I'll be at that end with Lisa. Yeah, that blah, blah, blah. Okay. But, uh, Any other questions, comments? <laughs> okay, so, so the next topic, again, uh, we went procedural rules, but the other procedure I think is pretty important, and, and I think council really knows this, but I just thought we'd go over it just in a setting where anybody can ask questions. It has to do with, with the Sunshine Act, and, and everybody gets – little nervous about Sunshine Act questions and what can you talk about, what can't you talk about. So the premise of the state law is that if you're going to take official action and vote, or if you're going to deliberate and talk about agency business, you have to do that at a public meeting. Um, there, the law clearly defines what a meeting is. It's a, a prearranged gathering meaning it's not a, just a happenstance where you all walk at the same corner and run into each other, so it's prearranged. It requires a quorum of the agency, so for you guys it needs four. Four of you need to be together. And if that happens, uh, you can't discuss or deliberate agency business, because if you do, uh, without having a properly advertised meeting, uh, you've kind of violated the Sunshine Law. So I'm not suggesting anybody here violates Sunshine Law, but, but that's what the definition is. So what the law also says is there are a number of topics that, that are exempt from that public discussion. No topics are exempt from voting, but discussion and deliberation can be done in executive session for topics that the state believes are not appropriate to, to be done in a public setting. And so those topics most commonly have to do with personnel matters uh, when you're hiring, firing, or disciplining uh, employees or personnel. If you're uh, selling or purchasing or leasing real estate. If you're uh, discussing litigation, both current pending litigation or threatened litigation, you're allowed to talk behind closed doors. And if you're talking about collective bargaining, meaning you're negotiating or talking about strategy for, for contracts, you're allowed to talk about that in executive session. Mm -hmm. And also when the rare occasion you're acting as a judicial body, you're allowed to uh, deliberate in executive session when you're making a decision. Uh, typically, for the most part, uh, that would be you when you have a conditional use hearing, although there are other times where you may be do you have a judicial component and you have the ability to hear testimony and then decide or deliberate at least in executive session? So apart from those main exceptions, everything else is to be done in public. Um, just because a four of you get together for dinner doesn't mean you've broken the sunshine law. Uh, there's certainly social events that you, you all can attend and it doesn't implicate anything. Uh, I would suggest that you not talk about borough business on those occasions because that just uh, leads to, you know, finger pointing or, or, or people think. So perception in, in that case is probably reality. It's probably more of a perceived thing than, than anything else, but, but it's always out there. Um, Evan's predecessor uh, uh, ran into four counselors in Cotillo's back in the mid-90s and uh, suddenly uh, made uh, stories and editorials probably for the next uh, year and a half, uh, and uh, it uh, was certainly made for interesting reading. But uh, just because four of you are together in the same room doesn't mean you've, you've done anything wrong or, or improper. So uh, that's kind of an overview of what the Sunshine Act is. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. If you have specific inquiries, I mean, 
Uh, I mean, the press always likes to say uh, there are possible violations or this was talked about and probably shouldn't have been, and, and they have their experts to interpret the law. But uh, for the most part, we try to make sure that everything is uh, conducted out here in the open. And the only time we exercise executive session rights for the topics we're permitted to do that and voting can occur in executive session has to come out here. So uh, that's the way we try and run everything. And if, if Justin or Dan have anything to add or anybody has questions, mm -hmm. I'd be happy to answer them. So. I would just like to suggest um, before and after meetings, if council, if you just make aware that you're not all standing in front of the building, um, gathering around, not that you're doing anything illegal. However, the perception is that council is violating the Sunshine Act because there are more than four of you and it's before and after the meeting. So while common citizens have complained about this, I have stood up for you, but I just want to say that's where people, when they're coming in and leaving the meetings, that's where it'll probably come up. And, and it would seem that it would be more uh, prone to accusation yes. if it happened before the meeting exactly. rather than after the meeting yeah, because you've done your business. Um, but again, <laughs> people can perceive and believe what they want. But again, just just be cautious when when you're you're in a group of your peers and you have a quorum. But uh, again, it's just more of a uh, a lesson, I guess, rather than uh, to be caught and. Uh, think that you're doing something wrong. Mm. Okay. No further questions? All right. Uh, we are now at uh, 22, comments from citizens present. And the rules oh. are uh, each speaker will have three minutes to address council. Council will not respond. Justin. <laughs> oh. Sure. Okay. I know, right? I ain't um, saying nothing. I just wanted to recognize someone that was in the crowd. I didn't recognize he was here until uh, after the meeting started. But uh, Justin was real excited to announce that the Tri-County Young Leadership Awards were issued to two people in Pottstown. And the firefighter that won, Ellie Scipio, is in the audience tonight. And I wanted to introduce him to the crowd. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, he's nominated by the fire chief. Barrow and the ambulance chief, he's one of our most active volunteers. He does both fire and EMS, and he's being recognized at that gala in wow. February. So yes. thank you for your service to our community. Thank you, Chief. We're, we're blessed to have such wonderful talent. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Our first commenter. Tracy Daywalt, please. Thanks. All right, Jim Lutz, please. Yeah, I, the borough manager is my, most of my, answer most of my questions about 441 Johnson Street. Um, and I thank you for that. And at least we're moving in the right direction, I believe. However, uh, since the last court hearing, well, actually between the fifth and the sixth court hearing about the number of dogs at 441 Johnson Street, it was nine at the time. Now it's ten. I, I think there needs to be a change in the ordinance or the code or whatever for the amount of dogs that you're allowed in a private residence in Borough Pottstown. I understand if they do change the law and, they're and, you, and you limit the number of dogs in a pr private residence, the dogs that are there are probably going to be grandfathered in. But when they pass on, at least she can't replace them. So maybe you can think about that. Thank you. Thank you. 
No further citizen comments. Okay. How about, uh, where are we? Councilor's discussions. Councilor Van, anything? No, I really enjoyed the rules that she went over, though. Okay. I like the topics. Councilor Prosco. Well, I enjoyed uh, attending the Martin Luther King service at the Hill, although I feel kind of guilty because that's one of the few times a year I go to church. But. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> supposed to admit that. <laughs> I, I, I know I sit with you, but the, uh, you, you certainly kept our manager busy with all the amendments and changes to our zoning and, and L and I in that. Well, it has been to work for nine your, months, I think. Your, uh, your committee's been busy. <laughs> Councillor Lindsay. So the mayor said everything, so I feel like <laughs> she's taking everything from me. I don't have my long speech anymore. No, okay. kind of bad. No, but. talk about the jobs. Census. Okay, yes, yes, the census people, yes, we need to make sure we get this money, so please do the census. I have to do it too, so you have to do it also. Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, I don't have, I feel like I'm speechless, like I don't have it. I'm usually blah, blah, and I don't even have it. Oh, there's a princess this weekend, um, the carousel having the princess down that's uh, this weekend. Oh, I visit the Ricketts Center. Um, it's coming along good. I was pleased to see, you know, progress in there. So Lydia, she's doing a good job. She showed me around and everything. So um, counselors, you guys need to go down there and check it out. We'll be there. Okay. Uh, let's see. And don't forget Cynical, the performance that the mayor talked about. Susical, sorry, that's a cynical. But anyway, mm -hmm. that's a, I don't have it. That's it. Oh, okay. NAACP, they have their um, interfaith thing with Joe and Bob and, and February 11th. Right. So at the carousel. Right? At the carousel. That's at the carousel too. Oh, and it's free ride. So bring your kids. We all can ride on a carousel for free. So I'll be there. That's it. That's all I have. Good, Councilor Paulus. First, I'd like to thank Justin for all his help he's been giving me with dealing some. Right. Would, you, would you stay close to the microphone? I'd like to thank Justin for his help he's been giving me for the last, what, month or two with constituents in my ward. He's been very helpful and informative. Um, and the only other thing I would have is uh, the Citizens Leadership Academy. I highly recommend it. The sign-up is coming up soon, so I would go online and check periodically. It's a wonderful class put on by Courtney High. You How really many times? learn a lot. How many times have I've you been, been through, through it? it? Every class she's had, like six now. And I had it twice, yeah. and Lisa twice. went. So all three of us met at the Leadership Academy yeah. class. And look at us now. So just take the class, and you'll be up here with us. <laughs> it's, it's, it's take a, the class. It's a very good That's learning learning experience. You get to see in depth of what some of the departments do in the yes. in the borough. Yes, it's really, yeah, I agree with good. you. Good. Yeah. Councilor Kirkland. Um, just, uh, you know, Black History Month, remember Black History Month? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. That's about it. Okay. Oh, and thank you, Chuck. So I apologize, I'm back on the census again, but I forgot. Okay, so they're still hiring. Um, if you want to, if you're interested and you need in a job, it's $27 an hour. Let me reiter reiterate and clarify for the record, this is not a job in the borough. This is a job with the census. So it's $27 an hour. Go to 2020census.gov forward slash jobs or you can call 1-855-JOB-2020. That's 1-855-562-2020 to apply. I believe they're taking applications up through March 1st. Um, and also, Strive is looking for mentors for the middle school. Now, I would love to participate and be a mentor, and I got my clearances and everything, but unfortunately, they meet um, at lunch. And so work <laughs> prohibits me from coming down to the middle school. So if you know of anyone who is available, retired, who wants to mentor or have lunch um, with some students, please contact 
David Charles or Laura Johnson on the school board. And you just have to get your clearances and you'll be good to go. Pretty That's good. it. Oh, I have one other thing. Um, Mika um, Patterson, she was also nominated for the um, leadership, for the young leadership. So, um, okay. For that gallon. That's it. I have nothing more to add. Great meeting adjourned.